other forms of entertainment. But the old idea of sitting around a meal, first of all, the meal is important as a metaphor because food is what gives us life. It's what sustains us, what gives us energy. Then we communicate around what gives us energy. It's the perfect setting for a discussion. The sense that a table is round and we can all look at each other and we can all have an interplay and we can share our day. That is the key. That dinner table is the key, and we believe, to strong families and strong relationships. And we're shocked by the numbers of families we meet who are willing to give up that dinner table to do activities every night and run around. And we, we certainly have evening activities, too, where we don't get to the table every single night, but we miss it any night we don't have it because it's at that table where kids learn trust. We can show them that we listen to them that will answer their questions. And that respect goes both ways. When kids feel listened to, they will tell you a lot more. And the better of a relationship you develop with them, when there comes that moment where it really counts for them to open up, they're going to be less likely to close down because you have that trust from the dinner table. Tell me a little bit about, um, again, a I, I put these in the promo to kind of get people to uh, wonder what these were, but you talked about being direct and avoiding clutter. You know, I learned that early as a lesson in life because my current background I have as a negotiator and a lobbyist, because at our dinner table growing up, we debated subjects, political subjects, current events, issues of the day all the time. And you didn't dance around the subject. You had to be direct. Why do you believe this? What do you believe? And defend your beliefs. And we do the same thing at our dinner mm -hmm. table. We don't bounce around the ideas. If you have an idea or you say something or you feel something, you also need to be able to back it up. And the whole statement, I don't know, or I was just wondering, I'm not really sure, or I just sort of felt that way. None of that cuts it. Right. We don't allow that. We have the kids then answer what it is they are thinking and also learn that from being in news where in TV news, if you have a minute 20 to tell a story, you can't have that clutter because the ums and the ahs and the truth be tolds and all the other weak language eats into your time. And we teach our children and our clients to strip away any of that fat, any of those filler words, because they become exit ramps for the listener to tune them out. And well, in fact, today I was in a Oh, a long meeting with a, a client. I was not running the meeting, uh, someone else with my firm, and which was useful because my job was to just kind of listen and see where things were going. And at some point, it came down to just the main client who was running the project. And the discussion took that road of, I'm kind of thinking, well, maybe, and um, mm -hmm. and whatever. And I stopped taking notes because I said, well, this is this isn't good. This is the kickoff and the person giving us direction hasn't said anything in the last 30 minutes. Not unintentionally, but I think like you said, it's that clutter we're so used to and we got back to the car. Unfortunately, the project manager for our side was experienced enough and I said, what'd you think of those last 30 minutes that I didn't understand any of it? And I said, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest, you know, <laughs> let's get back, figure out what never got answered and then let's follow up. But if I hadn't been sitting there and just realizing that not a thing was coming and how dis, I mean, I actually got bored to tears and I was a senior person in the room, which isn't a good thing mm -hmm. if, if I'm bored. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just that, that um, recognizing it at the very least that, wow, that was a whole lot of nothing meant that we need to come back together and to talk again, nobody's fault except my own. If I was to just let that go as well, kind of a, the, the meeting really petered out. Uh, and I think we all would prefer to do that, truthfully, than to have to go back and have a clutterless discussion, you know, the second time. Absolutely. It makes sense. You know, our 15-year-old recently took a job at, and since we live close by, at an ice cream place nearby. I know and when people, exactly, when people take the order, they don't walk in and say, well, he doesn't say, well, I, would you possibly like you know piece this kind of bread and what kind of ice cream were you thinking? Or I know it's like what bread do you want? What kind of meat? What kind of cheese do you want? This on it? Do you want chips? Real direct language, and I think that's learned from the dinner conversations. 
how to be direct, how to get an order, how to be efficient. You're talking about in business, how to be efficient, get to the next customer and make sure that person gets what they want. And we have to teach our kids that too, is that efficiency in language. And all these weak words are incredibly overused to the point that people don't realize they're saying them. And we'll play a game with our clients where we'll give them a word and ask them to tell us a story about that word. And any time they say an ah, um, like, you know, or so, or any other weak word that we share with them, we have everybody bang on the table. And that annoying sound helps them to realize, helps those words to come to the surface for them to get rid of them. Because a lot of times people will tell us, I don't use any filler words because they can't hear themselves. Oh, I think if they did one uh, mock Toastmasters group, um, which part of that we had done that in our office, and I wasn't didn't know what that was, but part of it is while you're doing your two to three minute talk on anything, it doesn't matter how important or meaningless it is, someone is recording all your filler words, mm-hmm. and they're checking them off, and they read them back to you, and... It's amazing how quickly it just drops after two sessions when people know that it's coming. You, you can get rid of it, but it's a conscious thing for sure. Um, we, you know, we took that message to the next level because we had done Toastmasters, and we realized that you have to hear them, but when you have people drumming, you will mm-hmm. never forget the sound of 10 to 15 people all banging on their desk <laughs> really hard. It, it quickly shocks you. And it may sound cruel, mm-hmm. but it's the only way to get people to begin to self-police. And the side effect of this is clients will constantly tell us years down the road that they still hit their leg or tap their arm anytime they or anyone they're with says one of these words as that reminder that they're saying it. And I think if people realize that how much freer they'll be when they're talking, you know, whether it's student to teacher, teacher to student, on the job, whatever it is, it's really worth it. And I'm just picturing you pounding on the table because the thing is, when we did our little tallies, it's very passive. Um, mm-hmm. And in fact, to be honest, I actually stopped going to the group just because for me it was kind of low energy. Which really oh, yeah. had nothing to do with the people. These are all my friends. Mm-hmm. We we're all getting. I like to hear all their stories. It was really great, but there was something missing from it from that formula. And what you're adding to it really is it that it's, you know, it's a stimulus, but it's done in a fun way. I mean, to be honest, it's you know whether you're throwing you know, you know, <laughs> stuffed animals at somebody. I've seen people do that. They just throw things that can't hurt to alert them. Um, but I, I like that a lot. Um, I was also we we about- took the idea of Toastmasters and just wanted to take it a next step because I think mm-hmm. what happened was the Toastmasters back in the day when it was started, started as a dinner opportunity. People right. have dinner and they do Toastmasters and it was kind of like the bowling leagues of the day. You had time to do that. But times have changed and business has changed. and you know, We had to take Toastmasters and, and, and move it to the 21st century where it's interactive, it's fast paced, and it also gets the job done without just lingering on and on. And it also creates buy-in because there are a lot of people who have sat through meaningless workshops and trainings, and we see them every time when they walk into our workshops. You can tell the people who are sitting there thinking, this is going to be the worst 90 minutes of my day. And the games that we do wake them up and achieve that buy-in in order to make the client happy, the overall client, to get their teams to engage. We we figure life is short. You're at work a lot. Let's have fun with it. Absolutely. And uh, but now what about when it goes a little too far? And I'm thinking back to, you know, your son is being taught to ask these point blank questions while he's, you know, taking people's orders. Be real clear on that. What happens, you know, when we interact and we, we cross a line? I mean, how do we, how do we tell people, you know, back off, you're crossing a line, like literally say it. How do people communicate that there's, uh, you call it having some fences here, that that's just a little bit too far? In our family, we use the term fences. As we shared in the article, what we do when we ask the kids a question that they may not feel comfortable answering, and it's not something that's going to hurt their safety, they are allowed to occasionally say fences. And when they say fences, it means they're putting up a fence between the two of us 
And we know not to press on with questions about whatever it is we're talking about. We respect their privacy, but they are only allowed to use that fence word on rare occasions. If they begin to abuse it, then they will lose the privilege. I'm talking about a customer. Mm -hmm. If a customer presses on or they push on, the fastest way to diffuse that is to throw back the customer what they're thinking ahead of time or to utilize humor and have fun with it if they're pressing too hard. You can never take a confrontation and hit it with the same power and strength that they threw it at you. Otherwise, you just have a stalemate. You've got to find a different way to diffuse that. It goes back to the whole concept we talk about all the time. In the famous book, The Art of War, is to, to understand your enemy, in a sense, and you can't fight with the same power or force. You have to find another way, another angle, another situation to change the dynamics so fighting fire with fire is not such a good idea it turns out right. yeah unless you really like fires i mean we see that people like that in the office that that's oh, yes. what they want they like again the bigger the mouth i must have a better mm -hmm. idea um and i actually ran into one of those things today where it wasn't loud but i was heading down that path where it was how do i make it real clear we're heading down a terrible direction and I, all i had was volume <laughs> that i felt like they said okay that's not going to work so didn't do anything uh to be honest we said we'll have to just we'll try tomorrow but i think you know i didn't have a word for it but it's just that i was looking for a different a different angle to that force a different something to diffuse it that was still strong but not going to become, you know, compounding where it all it does is aggravate both sides. We find that using something completely physical mm -hmm. is a good thing. For example, excusing yourself to make a call, use the restroom, go mm -hmm. check on something. Oh, I forgot something in my car. Anything physical that you can take yourself out of the situation. Many times when you return back, the person calm down and the whole motion is different in the room. What about um, you don't want to just you don't want to give in necessarily just because to let them have their way, but there are times you say you know what I'm going to let them have that one for a purpose, and it's mm -hmm. not so you can get even, um, it's not for the easy way out, but I as you all called it, it's the savings mm -hmm. account. You know you really want to find a way to to gain that trust. Let's talk about that there when it's it's worth giving in just a little bit. It, it's a compromise. And it, we encourage our kids when we're talking to them or, or clients to be forthcoming and say, hey, I'm willing to give this. I'm willing to move on this if you, you can do this. And, and teaching people how to negotiate and that negotiation doesn't have to be an adversarial experience. We do an exercise when we teach negotiation where we tell people to put their elbows on the table and clasp their hands together in pairs. And we avoid calling this arm wrestling. And we say to them, your job is to push your partner's hand down to hit the table as many times as possible. And it's a contest. You want to see how many times you can get your partner's hand to hit the table. And most people in the room inevitably turn it into an adversarial experience and they don't get any points because they're both fighting hard. The ones who will say, hey, let's let your hand hit the table five times and then mine, we each get points. We each give and we get. And helping people to infuse more of that into their conversations is key. Well, you mentioned um, there's a compromise. That's a pretty ugly word in a lot of you know situations where you're talking about learning you know, how to compete, how to do your best, uh, that to compromise, you know, we, we don't compromise period. Um, you want to have that never compromising attitude. Where did that get warped so badly? Because we become hyper competitive and we don't realize that you can lose the battle but win the war and that most things in life meet in the middle. If you look at politics, if you look at anything, most ideas, people are not on one polar or sphere, but people come and meet in the middle in life. And uh, we always teach a philosophy that meeting in the middle is winning. When you're polarized and you meet on one side or the other, 
you're going to get a polarized answer, and that's going to drag you into a direction you don't want to go. You want to have that consensus in the middle, and you're going to get the best solution. Yeah, I think that, you know,